My name is Ben. My name is Richard. And we got a good show for you today. We got, um, we're gonna beef about plumbing on a new tank. And then for the main thing, we're gonna talk about red dealing with red planaria. This show sponsored by saltwateraquarium.com and powered by Polyp Lab. Does anybody ever say uh, today we got a mediocre show for you? Yeah, we should say that. But today we have like <laughs> probably kind of one of our worst shows. <laughs> our, our, one of our worst shows. That is Talk a dumb thing to say. Something's vibrating over here. I want to fix it. Well, let's just let's just watch Richard. Hey, Richard. Yeah. I hate to see you go, but I love to watch you leave. Oh, baby. <laughs> I can't hey, fix it. Off, what, yeah. what anything interesting new going on with your uh i think uh, i'm gonna make a video of the display tank because everything's booming yeah uh oh there is i i bought a bunch of corals from a local guy uh rosario i think um he's in fremont so i drove about 45 minutes i really like buying corals from other reef keepers i mean yeah. i like stores and stuff too but there's you know i know everything i got out of his tank is captive grown uh, yeah. you know which is freaking awesome so i i bought a bunch of named corals i have no idea what their names are anymore because i i don't i don't i don't care but um i usually won't do that because then they get shipped and weird things happens and uh but but i know you know from his tank to my tank was an hour and they're doing well and so that was cool i got a couple yeah. of nice big pieces which i like um I, i'm shopping by color more uh which i'll get a video you know what I, I will promise I will have a video that we can drop into this. Okay. Um, so I'll videotape it tonight because it's looking good. The stuff is coloring up and growing and, you know, the dendros I think are going to take a long time to recover, but everything else is bombing. I'm, I'm actually happy with the tank right now. I'm a little confused. You said you're shopping by color. Yeah. So I look at, uh, I, I, I do the tank as a, as a, as a whole. So I'm not just buying a coral because it's cool, although I sometimes do that. But it's like I need a lighter color, taller coral, one that's going to grow to fill out this area and balance the tank in my eye. So yeah. I wanted something that was lighter colored for one area, and I wanted something that was uh, more purpley in another area. So that's that's often how it was I a do. really cool talk. One Macna where Paul Whitby did a thing on like aesthetics. Yeah, the color wheel. He talked a lot about Steve Weiss's tank, which was just gorgeous. And the, yeah. the, the, the things are like have uh, if you have three colors from the color wheel opposite of the color wheel near each other, they make a very pleasing look to the eye. So, I mean, that I mean, that struck me as crazy when I heard that because he was also talking about the the golden ratio and all that. Yeah. And I was like, man, I mean, that that's pretty masterful, like putting together a reef tank with all that in mind. That's like uh, like reefing with a with a purpose for real. <laughs> yeah. And so the golden ratio is three fifths. You have something that's three units high next to something that's five units high. And it's pleasing to what your brain thinks is pleasing. So it looks good to your eye no matter what. The thing you need to keep in mind with that is do you want it to be pleasing right when you set it up or do you want the corals to grow into the pleasingness, right? Because so you put tall corals here and sort of corals here and you'll get that look. You can also do it long ways as well. Man, I kind of have a sub beef about something you just brought up. Yeah. Because I'll get, um, you know, you'll see or I'll get people saying, does my aquascape look good? And or people just becoming overly obsessed with an aquascape. But I mean, as a reefer that's used to messing with mature reef tanks, like it all gets covered up. I, I get it, but because also too, there's a lot of different things to get excited about in this hobby, but it's like becoming too obsessed with what your aquascape is, it's going to get covered with corals and that's going to have to be managed in the long run. You won't even know what your aquascape looks like eventually. I understand people who want their aquascapes to look good and obsess about it. I get it. I totally get it. Because if that's all you've got, if you've got no corals, you want it to look good anyway. And yeah. You want it to be natural. The the thing, there's a couple things to understand about Aquascape, I think. One is that a lot of random stuff is going to look better than anything you plan. 
Yeah. You know, obviously there are different examples. You can do arches and swoops and things like that. And that looks pretty cool. But generally, if you want it to look natural, whatever the hell that means, um, random, a bunch of randomness is very useful in that. It, it definitely takes, um, you know, it's when, when new refer and you either kind of have the eye for it or not. And the eye for it can be developed if you put, you know, attention towards that, but it's like, you know, when I, I look back at my career, like how long it take me to look like I didn't like a human placed rocks right there. You don't want it to look like a human placed rocks right there. There's some weird, like controlled chaos that you eventually learn how to make. Yeah. The randomness makes your eye take it in as one, one continuous flow rather than something jarring. The yeah. other thing. The other thing I think you need to realize is that it's what are the corals going to look like when you put them in there as yeah. they grow. So you need to plan for that. And that's why, you know, almost all of my corals are movable. You know, Can you hear my son screaming? Yeah, but I love that. That makes me feel like, you know, we're we're at one of your border facilities in Texas and recording. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Just some uh, random kid in a cage screaming yeah, for his mother. It's great. Um, so I like my corals to be movable. So I usually will glue a coral to a rock and then, or a piece of rubble, and then glue that to the reef scape. So I can almost literally go into my tank and move anything. Um, and so as things are growing, I can move them around to make room for something else or, you know, and then you start trimming things and it becomes more like a gardening than anything else. And I really like that. Powered by Paula Lab. Powered by Paula Lab. Hey, Beefers, this episode is powered by Polyp Lab. Richard, Polyp you, Lab. Use, you use some Polyp Lab stuff. I do. I when, I when I'm spawning corals, the baby corals, the settlers, the tiny little ones, they settle down with no um, symbiotes, no zones on Thillae or symbiodinium or whatever you want to call them this week. And they need to eat. And one of the foods I feed them is the, the polyp lab food. I have it, I have it over here somewhere. Here it is. Do you have to do you have to prepare it a certain way? Like what's your method for using it? The reefroids. I use the reefroids and I use the polyp booster. So I put the polyp booster in uh, to, to make everything hungry. I do this in the main reef at the house too. And then I take the reefroids and I put it in a cup of uh, water, a cup of tank water, stir it around. And uh, either I'll flood feed, uh, often with, with settled corals, I have them in a tiny tray uh, that has water flowing through it and I'll turn off that water flow um, and I'll pour the food in and make sure it mixes really well. And then I'll leave it for 20 minutes to half an hour. And then I'll turn the flow back on again and that rinses it out into the rest of the system to feed everything else as well. In the um, in the main system, I do the same thing. I'll put the polyp booster in first to help everything open up. And then I have a converted, I, uh, we should do a video on this of how I, how I feed, uh, drip feed over time. Um, I have a, a container that I put food in and it doses essentially over about 45 minutes. And that's how I feed it to my main reef. Is it that same one you had hanging off the back when I was there? It's a new version of it. You know, we'll, we'll do a little video on that to, to, to have out. Uh, there's, a, there's a way that I use Refroids when I uh, first approach, uh, uh, you know, when I get to a client and the, one yeah. of the first things I do is I'll, I'll shut off their skimmer and I'll take a, it, it's kind of weird, but I'll just take a fat pinch of Refroids in my fingers and I'll swish it in their sump and I'll let the main pump push it up into the aquarium and kind of storm it that yeah. way. And then I'm getting my other stuff ready, you know, the water, the this and that. And so I like to do that wet skim where I just make the skimmer kind of puke out the water change. Sure. So I'll start, you know, I kind of storm it and then I feel like I remove a lot of it, let them eat and then remove a lot of it by wet skimming for the water change. That seems like it does something. Oh, that's a great way to feed it, I think, because then you put it in and then they eat what they want and you're doing a water change anyway. That's a perfect time to flood feed is right before the water change. That's great. I mean, I mean, that, that, that German style that I've, you know, always known about that was always kind of like heavy in, heavy out that seemed, yeah. to, fit, seemed to fit with it. And their, yeah. uh, their cyan acrylic glue, their uh, gelatinized super glue, I use that a lot. They have a big old container 
with a bunch of little tubes. And I like that because when you get one big tube, the the nozzle always gets mucked up. So I like using their little tubes of of uh, super glue for frags. So it's like a per use. It's like, yeah, oh, you're going to use that a, much and you're done. Or a, or a couple, but it's not so much that you're really mucking up a nozzle. You can kind of just go through them. Awesome. So this episode, powered by Polyp Lab. Thanks, Polyp Lab. Powered by Polyp Lab. Powered by Polyp Lab. When you're gluing rocks to other rocks, I use super glue. And the way I do it is I put super glue on my finger and I prime it onto the area of the rock scape that I want to glue the smaller piece to. Underwater? Underwater. Glue, rock scape that's permanent. And then I have the other, the frag. Glue on my finger, wipe it on the area where I want to put it, clean off my finger a little bit, take the other piece, the big rock or small rock with the coral on it. Sometimes I put the coral on first, sometimes I don't. Um, put glue on this piece of rock, stick them together, hold it for about, and pull it a little bit, put it together, pull it a little bit, put it together, and then it'll set up and then I let it sit for 20 minutes so it gets solid. And then it's all good. And then you can bump it, but you can still pry it off if you want to. But it's great. And then, oh, I only let it sit for 20 minutes if I'm then going to glue something to it. Right? Um, but you can, I put big ass pieces of rocks onto other things by, but you got to prime it first because the super glue sticks to super glue really well. And what the priming does, you know, some people say put a bunch of glue on the, on the rock and then smear it around but it's, it's harder to get that glue to get into the nooks and crannies of the rock and really hold because as soon as you put super glue in water, it gets a skin. Yeah. Because the, the water the, is really what makes the super glue set up. Um, so if you smear it around really well, you can use a glove too. You don't have to put it on your finger. Um, but then when you go to glue it together, it, it bonds really quickly. So that's, if that's my tip. If I if I remember too, isn't it the thing where like lack of oxygen helps it harden? That's not my understanding. My understanding is the water actually is what is the catalyst. Okay, I don't know where I saw that from, but yeah, because that's I, why it takes a long time. If you're gluing super glue um, dry in the air, it, it can take a long time for it to actually set. But if you drop some water on it, it sets up pretty quick. Yeah. But you could be right. Maybe there's something to the accelerators uh, that that has something to do with oxygen. I don't know. We should look that up. Hey, in uh, in my world, I want to say a quick thing about the maintenance world. Um, so I use this little thumbtack, this little app called Thumbtack that helps me find potential clients. Yeah. Now. It's sort of hit and miss, and there's a lot to be there's a lot to make fun of the Thumbtack Act, Act for. It, it's usually a lot of really low level stuff that I have to sift through, but uh, I, I kind of wanted to throw this out there for any listeners that we, to any beefers that we have that might be like me, like a maintenance person. Um, which this is just my opinion on this, but I don't, you know, when anyone asks me, you know, can I do this, this, and this? from a sales perspective, I don't say no to anything. The, the way I approach that is I will do it through money. Meaning if someone has a 10 gallon freshwater aquarium, they want me to do this and this and this, I'll make the time for it. If you meet my hourly rate, I don't care because first and foremost, I am a business and I'm supposed to put money in the bank. So I think, you know, telling people like, no, we don't do that. I mean, that's every business is called to do that. But, you know, I, I've literally been paid $150 an hour to clean a, a beta bowl. Yeah. Uh, and I, I've done it. Yeah. Now, those are few or far between because you'll shut down a lot of potential clients because, oh, that's this other guy will do it for half the price. And there's no reason to be rude about it at all. Just say, I'm sorry, that's, the, you know, what it takes for me to get out there and do that. And I fully understand. Um, but yeah, so I just kind of wanted to share that with any maintenance beefers out there. Maybe, you know, toss that around. Think about it. Be sure that you're not just telling people no. Give them a price and it'll surprise you sometimes. Cool. So, hey, Richard. Benjamin. I have a beef. Bring on the beef.
Um, all right, so but let me preface this before I get into it. So we're gonna, I'm gonna have Snowman show a couple pictures right here while I'm talking about what I'm talking about. And I, I wanna preface this because these are just random pictures I pulled off of the internet. And hopefully if someone sees this and they're like, that's mine, I mean, no offense by it. I'm just trying to make a point. You totally mean offense, but go on. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, if you find yours on here, no offense, man, but- God, I so, hope there's a picture of my tank on this. Oh yeah, no, your tank is so different in another way. Well, the beef is having overly too many small holes for drains and returns, thus giving you an overly complicated plumbing scenario. Now, in certain scenarios, that's kind of hard to get around. But, but first of all, like this is my first aquarium or you know, you don't really know what you're doing. It's just understandable. People that get used tanks or anything like this. If you're going, if, if you're for once in your life, you had some spare cash, whatever's going on, you're like, I'm going to get a tank. This is going to be the tank that I've planned from the beginning, this and that. And you, so you have control over everything that's going to happen. You know, if you're asking for another company, like such as my company to get a custom tank made, first of all, most of the clients I deal with, they leave all this up to me. But so I'm, I'm you know, it's like, you'll see like a 400 gallon aquarium that has like four one inch drains and you know like 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 two or three like three quarter inch or one inch returns like i kind of me this is a personal beef i suppose because you're kind of looking quizzical and it's just that like i like bigger drains because they make less noise anyways and it's less piping being routed to where you want it to go so i mean Go ahead. I'm with you. I, I mean, I like bigger drains as well. Uh, I like them because they're less likely to clog. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the one thing I never want to happen is for my drains in a tank to get clogged because I don't want any floods. So I always oversize because I'm an oversized queen. Uh, <laughs> oversize my drains. Even these back here, I think these have one inch. Okay. And that, that worries me. I'd like it to be inch and a half, but yeah. sometimes you're practical. But on the inside of the tank, I have a T and there's actually two screens inside the tank. So if one gets clogged and of course, screen your freaking drains, yeah. um, even if they're in your overflow, screen your drains, uh, I think, because a snail gets over and goes down your drain, you're you're in trouble. Um I also get the idea. So that's how I deal with redundancy. I like redundant drains, but I think what you're saying is a lot of small drains is a weird kind of redundancy because they're restricted. I'd rather have, if, if you're going to, if you're going to do a lot of, if you're going to do four drains, make them big anyway, right? The cost is like no, it's almost negligible at that point. Well, and if you, yeah, and if you, if you, if you, if you can catch it from the beginning, you're asking a company to build a tank and you're specking it out. Ah. Don't, don't get, don't get a 500 gallon that has four one inch drains. Cause so. What would you do you, instead? So what I would do instead is just do a couple inch and a half or maybe two inch um, drains. Yeah, because first of all, smaller drains, are, you're going to have more trouble with gurgling. Now, yeah. this gets complicated because, you know, some people are getting like a ghost overflow. Some people have like coast to coast. Some people have, you know, get the back drilled. Some people have the standard like reef ready partition. So I've realized there's different tanks that you could be ordering. And I'm I'm kind of speaking to like the standard, you know, in tank overflow that, yeah. that that's been industry standard, but you know, and you'll see by the pictures that um that I'll have up. It's just you know, and from the installer thing, I can't believe that a company wouldn't think of that anyways, because you'll see some of these like you're you're turning what could be a, a relatively simple plum job into some sort of chemical factory nightmare. What <laughs> it may look cool, but it's just so much is going on. There's no reason for it. I think they're thinking multiple drains is good. Uh, and I think that's true. Multiple drains are good, but you know, two one inch drains don't equal an inch and a half drain. Yeah. I mean, you could, there are snails that could clog up an inch and a half. I mean, an inch drain. It's, it's pretty, pretty uncommon for an inch and a half drain. Yeah. Even, 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 but I mean, even just flow wise, 
one inch and a half drain is going to drain more than more water than two one inch drains. Yeah. Yes. So it's it's not. I, I get that people think it's the simple math. You know, with two one inch drains is two inches of drain. So that's going to be more than an inch and a half drain. But it, it's not. It's not how it actually works out. Well, and each one of those drains is just going to be more filled with water and making more noise. More filled you know? with air, air and water. And yeah. then the other thing that uh, to me, I think is kind of annoying is you have like multiple return lines drilled into the bottom of the tank. Just get one larger line. And if you need to parse that out, come up to the top and parse that out through the plumbing. Yeah, you know, it used to be, you know, anytime you drill through the bottom of the tank, I get nervous. I mean, I, that's why I like coast to coast overflows now. Or, or the whispers, whatever on the back, because drilling through the bottom, you know, if there's a problem, your tank drains to the bottom. Oh, but you're talking about like, uh, because I'd mean like returns coming through the overflow box, but you kind of what oh, you're alluding to is another scenario that man, with all these years have been doing this, really never been fond with it is the, uh, um, shoot, what's that called? When you have, when a larger tank and you get you drill it in the bottom and you just have a pump circulating brain fart. Um, no, when you get a a, um, a butt. Oh, he's gonna have to edit this out. No, this I, no, this has got to stay in. This is gold. No, but me as a professional, not remembering what this it's, is called is ridiculous. Oh, I understand. Close loop. Close loop. <laughs> Close loop. I. I don't love closed loops, but when you're dealing with like a very tall or a very large aquarium, sometimes you kind of got to do that. But I don't, I don't like burying like intakes and returns in rocks. And I don't yeah. like, you See, know, if the tank drains, it drains all the way from there, you know? I like closed loops. I mean, I, I guess I understand. I want to get to the point about the, the drilling up with the returns. I get that. It saves space. Me personally... I'd rather candy cane stuff over the edge than have something come through the bottom. I get some people like that super clean look, but man, I, you know, my tank has got two drains through the bottom and I hate it. Um, you know, eventually that tank will explode and my reef will die and everything will end up. Don't on the say that. That's um, so nihilistic. Dude, I do not have, I cannot control the universe by saying it. I, I do not have that power. <laughs> if I did that, that would be fantastic. If me yeah. just saying it made it happen. Um, I have the power. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and I'll also get a million dollars in the next two days. Oh, if you reply to that chain mail that your uncle sent you. Uh, if you respond in the tank in the comments, yes. I'll get a million dollars. Pray um, for Richard. Pray for <laughs> So I like to do things up and over. So for my closed loop, I do a candy cane drain, right? And intake. So it's plumbing that just comes up and over the side, like a candy cane. Well, and that's, an, that's another scenario. If you're, if you build a tank into a wall, like, like yours is don't, don't get it. Don't get a return line drilled through the bottom. Just leave that overflow. If you're doing that standard overflow, just get the drains in there and do like Richard said, just come up over the top. There's no reason to pierce the bottom of the tank for something. Now, if it's like freestanding against the wall, th that's possible too to not drain it for the return too. It just depends if you can do it cleanly or not. But what is at the, at the basis of, of your beef? What do you really not like? Sum just, it up in a sentence. Just too much plumb, too many plumbing lines all over the place. Ah, so simplify your friggin' plumbing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Plumbing you'll, from you'll see these sumps with like four friggin' intakes for like drains and it's like, you know, and, and it can look cool. It can look satisfying for the like OCD okay. thing. But it's just a, a nightmare of plumbing that doesn't need to exist. Got it. Got it. I, I, we understand your beef. <laughs> your beef is understood, good sir. Thank you for understanding my beef. Your beef is understood. <laughs> beef. 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 This episode is also brought to you by saltwateraquarium.com. Also known as Swatacom. Swatacom. It's not <laughs> called Swatacom. We just call it Swatacom. We just like that. So we're running with it. Yeah, we like it. Uh, and we like saltwateraquarium.com. We've been using them before this podcast existed. Uh, I, I've always liked them because they're, they're efficient and they're large enough, but they're small and family owned at the same time. So 
you know, they're on top of it. They're paying attention. Um, so I, I, I dig them a lot because there's uh, been a little, there's been some consolidation in the industry recently. And I think it's, it's I always, I don't know. I kind of always like, like family owned operations. You, it's more personal. And I think there's a benefit there. So I always like to support that kind of thing. One of the ways that they're able to get um, your stuff that you ordered to you so fast, they have three different shipping locations throughout the United States. So that helps them get it out the door and to your door. Out their door to your door. They ship out 95% of their orders the same day. So that's pretty amazing. Yeah. You know, a lot of these things are people have to compete with Amazon. So, you know, and I, I would rather, I really would rather give my money to a family owned business where, the, you know, I order stuff from Amazon, but not aquarium stuff. And uh, I just much rather give saltwateraquarium.com my money than them. You know, they have a new thing too, where they're starting to, um, sell cleanup crews and and there's a bunch of companies that do this and whether you want to call it cheesy or not those companies will just align themselves with a wholesaler and kind of do it that way they don't really have any control over getting the stuff in or you know the treatment of the animals or anything like that they're just kind of slapping their name on it yeah but i was speaking with kenneth the owner of saltwateraquarium.com and they're doing this stuff in-house so it's a, you know, they have a whole cleanup crew situation that you can order livestock from. That's great. And, you know, I need some cleanup crew. And so I'm going to order from them and I'll report back on how good it is. I'm assuming it's going to be good because they don't do anything so far that I've seen that is not good. So I'm excited to actually try that out. They yeah. ship everything, um, uh, UPS next day air. Um, they, they say they don't have anything small. You know, um, so it's great. They're building the programs. They don't drop ship, so it's great. And and as always, they have free shipping on all orders, no matter the minimum purchase price. So you buy a piece of tubing, that's free shipping. I'm gonna order one snail and see what happens. Well, I, I, they once sent me uh, a one foot length of orange RO tubing. You're serious? Yeah, I wanted orange, uh, so they sent it to me in one foot holy cow <laughs> they just free charged shipping. for it or gave it to you free shipping they charged me for the tubing it's like 12 cents and uh, <laughs> the future is here yeah i think mostly they were doing it to be funny which is yeah. awesome but they did it and their stuff is all uh it, it it is free shipping um you can pay with amazon pay google pay paypal or credit card or whatever you want they have a uh, veterans and military and civil service discounts uh healthcare workers get discounts they got a loyalty program uh five percent buyback stuff which i used when i bought some um some uh some molybdenum uh the other day and uh then they have a bunch of content too um uh i know you've written some oh, stuff yeah. for them I'll, uh, I've written some stuff for them and they've got their own Facebook group. That's not just a regular Facebook group, you know, filled with crazy people. It's uh, it's their own Facebook group where they have uh, deals and uh, special insider content and beta testing stuff. And you could probably bug Mark Callahan on there too. I, and, and you should, you a hundred percent should tell him beef sent you. Yeah. Anyway, we could go on and on. And I think we've gone on too long about this, but we like saltwateraquarium.com and thank you guys for your sponsorship and go check them out. Mention beef. They were very happy to be our sponsor. Um, some people wrote to them and told them um, that uh, they were shopping with them because they heard about saltwateraquarium.com from us. And uh, we're moving to saltwateraquarium.com and, and saltwateraquarium.com is really happy that we're talking about some of the social issues that they think are important to talk about as well. So we really dig them. So go check them out. What's their website address? Saltwateraquarium.com. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. It's not complicated. <laughs> Beef. 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 Hey, Ben, we're almost at 500 subscribers. Man, that is awesome. That's really and there cool. Was a there was a guy in the comment section of one show that said we would never get to 500. And I'm just super joyed because that was only like a week or two ago. So it's kind of like a snowball effect. We may never get to it. 
oh, what if we stopped at 499 and that yeah, guy was- Then I would never have to do a show from my crawl space. And it turns out that that guy is like God. Yeah, well, maybe he can make my tank explode so I could get a new tank. Oh, hey, everybody, let's let's pray. Let's have one of those prayer chains in the comment thread for, you know, thoughts and prayers for Richard's tank exploding. <laughs> Please, in the name of Jesus Christ, let's ask that Jesus and God, who are the same person, to <laughs> blow up Richard's tank. Uh, all, I'm going to say to all religions, you yes. can even send good vibes to have my tank explode. And I think like that Ganesh and Vishnu yeah. and, you know, it's Thor. Kali. And uh, Thor, Thor yep. could come in and just smash my tank with Mjolnir. With Mjolnir, yeah, it would be <laughs> awesome. Hell um, yeah! I don't want that to happen, but if it did, can you, you know, the new the new system would be really fun to put together. Oh yeah, I really can, don't. I don't. I don't really want to, but it would be fun. Yeah, so. put that caveat in there. And so at 500 subs, I'll do a show from underneath the uh the crawl space and um thank you everyone for subscribing and for sharing our stuff around and that that helps us out and for everyone who's bought us a beer and for all the members and for all the people who buy merch this is some secret home lab merch yeah. that we have we have merch um, on our website go we to reef ships reefbeepodcast.com uh the next show is going to be a, uh we're going to answer uh beefers questions uh, and you get to that through the pot. Ask, ask, ask. Reef beef is on, on our site, and uh, we just, uh, you know, thank you for the continued support. We really appreciate it. It helps us do things like buy Ben a new cable to plug in his phone, so yeah. it works better because, for him. Because uh, I'm technologically handicapped. Yeah, we really, really, really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you, beefers. Powered by beef. <laughs> beef, reef beef powered by beef and reef and, and reef reef. Factory there somewhere but probably mostly beef so i think we'll, we we're we're gonna try to take on pests for a little while so yeah like for, for one segment we're going to talk about a particular pest what is our what is our pest today ben our pest for today is well, I was going to say red planaria, but I've had all sorts of different types of planaria or flatworms. Let's just yeah. talk about red planaria. That's what I think. <laughs> and we're sticking to it. Damn yeah. It. By God. Um, man, so uh, I'm thinking about my whole career spanning since the mid 90s, like just planaria, not just red, like even beige and stuff like that. Just planaria is a thing that creeps up now and then. And uh, I think it, it takes a lot of new reefers, you know, like, you know, the typical, what is this? Oh my God, it's all over my aquarium. So in case you're unfamiliar, you know, red planaria or, you know, red flatworms, they're just kind of a rusty, you know, what, what's, a, what's a good like Texas size food bowl size comparison? They're like the size of a, you know, like a, a two fleas. <laughs> Why do I always have to use these painful like measurements? They're like if two sesame seeds were glued together. That's how <laughs> big they are. Yeah, they're they're tiny. They're usually rusty, rusty red, orangey colored, and you know you'll just start to they'll they'll kind of they'll start to multiply around the edges of the substrate and the rock. They'll get on your rock. They'll get you'll see them moving across the glass. You know. I guess you could say that that like a what is that saying the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure like so that's why it's usually pretty good to dip you know to do some sort of protocol <coughs> for corals you know and while I was thinking about doing this show I was laughing at myself for a tangential thought because for as much you know you know pounding my fist on the pulpit of what should be done like Richard and I talked about this once in a further episode. It's just like, I don't always take the advice that I give out all the time. So, I mean, I get hit with red planaria. So I think I have a tank right now that, that was that's struggling with red planaria that I got to take care of. But I, I want to point out, there's really, there's almost never an actual problem with red planaria. They're just- Yeah, to, to my knowledge, they don't really hurt anything. Yeah, they can they can cover a coral to block photosynthesis, maybe, uh, but that's pretty rare. It's it's mostly just people don't like how they look. So 
you know, if I see a few of them, I just don't, I really don't care. I, I mean, I'm surprised I don't have them at home anymore. It's just not a thing that happens to me anymore. Um, you know, they're just a thing. So if I see a few of them, I don't care about them. They can explode. You know, maybe it's like everything else as a tank matures, you kind of other things are using whatever the planaria are using to live. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I definitely would say, like, if you start to see red planaria, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do anything that might jeopardize your whole tank because it's not right. like, it's not like that. It's not a um, panic situation. Yeah, but yeah. you know, I would try to get rid of them. So Salifert makes, uh, Salifert makes a product called the um, platform exit. exit. Yeah. yeah. And, but you got to, I mean, just with all things, you need to read the instructions very carefully. So there is one thing that's bad about red planaria is if you kill them en masse, apparently they contain some sort of chemical that, that can hurt your tank. Yeah. So the idea is, and we should get back to, you know, non-chemical means for dealing with uh, red planaria, but the, the idea is that some people, when they dose flatworm exit, they have problems. And it could be that they have a negative reaction to flatworm exit, or it could be that there's something in the flatworms. And if you kill too many of them at once, you follow your water with that compound. Um, yeah. I have no idea if that's supported by you know evidence or not. I've used flatworm exit a lot over yeah. the day a lot and i kind of have my method down what's, what's your method well it's like uh you know i don't have the bottle in front of me but it's something like one drip per gallon you know so you try to come up with the most accurate amount you can now if you have poly filter if you have carbon if you have any sort of like absorptive resin you know uh chemicline anything like that you want to take that out um flatworm exit i'm trying to think it does not make your skimmer go nuts I turn off no, the it, it doesn't though. I'm thinking of, yeah. that's that's for the red cyanobacteria. That's yeah. that. so it doesn't make your skimmer go nuts. But so remove remove out any absorptive media, you know that that could pull it out, and you you do that amount up to your gallons. And mine is tricky because since I'm doing maintenance, I can't really sit there all day. So I'll I'll dose and I'll sit there. I'll do some other things for about an hour. And then I'll go in after that, do a big water change, probably bigger than I'm normally going to do. I'll throw in new carbon. I'll put in, you know, brand new absorptive media, you know, and then I have to walk away from it. I've done this like, like, like yeah, yeah, yeah. three dozen times. Now, with, with not letting it go past an hour, what I usually have to do is dose it every single time I'm there for like three or four different times. So it's kind of like a a multi-month process that I have to get through Interesting. because if, if you're just a hobbyist, you know, you would dose it and probably let it run for like half a day or maybe even a day, you know, Don't no, do that. They, say, they say, no, you're doing about the same thing. Yeah, no, I would not let it run very long. Um, uh, uh, when I dosed it, I've dosed it a bunch of times as well. Um, I follow the instructions and it says, you know, uh, you, at 30 minutes or 45 minutes, you look for the flatworms to be agitated and start to die. Um, sometimes I'll double the dose or, or, or add more at that point to really kind of hit them for a little while once they've started going down. But then at 45 minutes or an hour later, I'm doing a big water change. I'm putting new carbon in and uh, I'm getting everything running the way it was running before. And I think for me, that's, I think, the important part. Anytime I see a medication or a fish additive, you know, an aquarium additive that says, you know, run new carbon or, or, or I hear through the interwebs, you know, there are reports of problems, possible problems with it. I'm doing a massive water change and running new carbon right when it's done. And I'm saying, you know, a massive water change. I'm not, you know, don't do a 30% water change and then do a 40 and then another 30% water change. Do a 50 or an 80% water change. Yeah. Hit it because the dilution is better with a one bigger water change than smaller ones. Um, that, that is a point too. Be sure if you're going to do that, you know, don't do this and then mix up water. Be right. sure that you've mixed up a, a massive because, and that's a good point for even besides this, you know, if you're going to do something 
where you need you need to do a massive water change that will be less disruptive to your system if you already had that crap mixed up like two days ago yeah. and ready to go so i what i would say is follow the instructions but plan so we can talk about this if you have carbon ready to go and rinse have enough water to do a big ass water change whatever you decide i do at least a 50 percent water change on it 50. because um when, at the uh at the steinart what i would do is because we had essentially infinite fresh water if infinite new salt water um i would just flush the tank for several hours i you know because it's a temperature it's all good all i had to do is turn a, a a valve open and and balance to drain and i would run the tank to drain for a couple hours and really get rid of it all when i do it here i would do a 50 percent water change um but have all that ready plan it, i i think that's critical if if there are, is there evidence that there could be a problem why are you risking your tank right um besides that prep what you were saying before about make removing as many as you can, right? So um, I think because uh, I, I cut you off because I cut you off about it, I want you to have the first word about it. <laughs> so I do a little method that I'll do sometimes it, when I'm rehabbing someone else's aquarium that's messed up. So it's a little trick that I have where you get one of those you know filter socks that you know old school that you might you know put on your drain overflow. So I'll put that on their sump and I'll take like a, you know, just from Home Depot, like a, like a, like a pincher, like a, what am I trying to say? Like a know. clamp, a clamp. Uh -huh. I'm really, I'm really on a roll today. Yeah. So you, you clamp that on the side of the sump. Then I'll take a, you know, a thin diameter hose, like maybe half inch or smaller, five eighths, something like that. You know, and I'll get it in the tank. I'll get a step stool if the tank is high, gravity siphon. And I'll put it into the bag. I'll make sure it's secured into the bag. And so really you don't disrupt the tank running. You're not doing a water change, but I'll start going through and siphoning out where I'm seeing these little suckers. They're just falling into the bag. So I'm not doing anything like a water change. It's just putting it back into the sun. You know, and I'll do that for a long time and try to remove as many as I can see. Because, you know, like they say, I've never, I've never experienced, and it's hard to say, I've never experienced, because I have also double dosed flatworm exit. And then I'm always like, you know, it, it, could it have been the flatworm exit that agitated something? But I think what they say is it's whatever, whatever um, compound comes out of the dying flatworms. Yeah. Now I had something happen about six months ago where, um, now I don't know the name of them, but those little tiny brittle, brittle starfish. Micro brittle stars. stars. Micro brittle stars. I dosed the heck with some flatworm exit in a tank, and that tank had a massive amount of micro brittle stars, and they started climbing out of the rocks and writhing and dying too. And were they I, spawning? They weren't spawning because I've seen them do that before. They were they were writhing and dying. The whole thing ended up derailing the client's tank. So between the red planaria and the micro brittle stars. You know, over months and months, it you know, I it developed a bad hair algae problem, and I started you know doing everything that it could. it's just there must have been thousands or tens of thousands of micro brittle stars yeah. in there. Just I guess biologically threw off the system. This is the problem with dosing. You uh, you know, with chemicals, is you're never sure what's going to happen. There can always be unseen effects. I I used to what I when I prep a tank to dose with flatworm exit is um it's usually because there's a lot of flatworms so you usually i'll pull out whatever rocks or leather corals or whatever i can that are infested and i'll dip them in fresh water uh and because that that'll kill off the flatworms too and at least they, make them they let go. hate fresh water they will fly right off yeah fresh so uh uh you know at at the academy i used to be able to just open a tap and run them underwater um here you know i'll make a bucket of, of of di water and i'll kind of match the ph's because that makes a lot of sense i think if i'm going to dip for any longer than 12 seconds um give them a good swish and then put them right back into the tank um i do that if it's obvious and easy um but having done it a few times where there were way more flatworms than i thought or could see i switched to the i'm just going to do a massive water change at the end of this instead uh, I used to, you know, put a, a, a 
a rigid airline tubing and do and siphon them out that way. A piece of rigid airline tubing with a piece of silicone tubing on the tip, cut so it's less abrasive to corals and you can actually squish it against things and suck them up. Um, so yeah, uh, if you can get rid of a bunch, but always be prepared and always know that there may be way more flatworms than, than you know about. So with, be ready. with the, with the ounce of prevention thing, when you, when you, when you're buying corals, you know, if you do some sort of protocol, like two little fishies revive, or, you know, there's a bunch of different dips, yeah. um, freshwater for some things, but like Richard and I talked about in another episode, freshwater will piss off some corals pretty badly. Yeah. But whatever you're doing, like that's another thing, red planaria, they've never seemed to me, they don't adhere to a substrate like very strongly. It's not a strong little creature. So even just swishing a new coral around, hell, even just switching, swishing it around in some salt water might dislodge it but enough. You can, you can baste them and they'll pop off as well. And yeah. most of your dips are gonna, are, are gonna make them let go anyhow. Yeah. So even, even the most modest of dips is a good idea to keep planaria at bay because they're just uh, people generally don't like how they look. Meh. Okay, so here's here's an interesting one. The, this was a fun one, man. This was a while back ago. It's probably a little over ten years ago. I had a client with a five hundred gallon, where he didn't have red planaria. They were like beige and they were larger. Yeah, but they were absolute. Again, like they don't really hurt anything, but they can get to such plague proportions that it would just freak you out yeah so at that time i ordered the nudibron and i believe it's kalinoduria variants yeah um and they're real sweet looking they're black with like metallic blue lines on them yeah and uh, actually i'll put i have a really old video because i recorded it um i have a, a video of them eating uh, these planaria off the glass now it's going to look really digitized because it's a video from like 10 15 years ago and it I, if, even if it was an apple phone it would have been like a three or something like that so it's not the best photo quality but they were hunting them down and they had i don't know if i'm going to call it a proboscis or what but they'd get close and they would like suck the juice out of them um i've seen them from time to time on lists but i don't think it's all that common getting them you know, yeah, I, I would suggest nobody ever buy those animals again. Oh, for, for real? For real. Why? What's real. the deal with them? All they eat is flatworms. Okay. And so many things we have in our tanks are going to eat them. And they're so prone to getting sucked into any kind of pump and dying. Yeah. They're, it's just a, it's a death sentence for those animals. They do not live in our tanks long term. Do you know, do they, they get them out of the wild? I mean, certainly they don't raise them, maybe? A hundred percent, they get them out of the wild. Oh, okay. So that is a bummer. If they yeah. were raising them, and, then... And they're, they're also not really great at hunting down planaria. They're just, they're, they're not super efficient at it. It's like... They did uh, not I, solve the problem. Yeah. They ate a lot of them, but they did not solve the problem. It's how I feel about Bergia. It's like they're, they're, the biological control isn't actually going to do what most people want it to do, which is eliminate the problem. I recommend not getting any biological controls unless you like that animal. You know, I, I will say, I will say sapphire damsels is in my experience, I've gone through just dozens and dozens. I love putting them in reef tanks simply for the fact it's a little diminutive fish. It has a great attitude. It doesn't have an attitude like other damsels. So it's, it's a fish. It's a fish you like, whether or not it eats the flatworms, who cares? Never seen it. Yeah. I would, you know, even peppermint shrimp are problematic, can be problematic. I've seen peppermint shrimp, you know, I stopped putting them in when I realized that they were, this was, you know, 20 years ago, uh, because they steal food from your corals. Yeah. And in extreme cases, they can rip open corals to steal food from inside the corals, uh, right? Because if you got a peppermint shrimp and you want it to eat, uh, a pest like an aptasia, you don't feed the tank so much so they get hungry and eat the aptasia, but then when you do feed stuff, they're gonna eat it. So I, I'm not, you know, the, the days for me of getting animals in there, except for copper banded butterflies, because I like that fish as well um, for eating aptasia. They don't always eat aptasia, so you gotta like the fish. Uh, I, I'm not really shopping for fish to deal with pests. Yeah. 
It's a, or any animal. It's just, I don't think it works. I, I so the I mean, amount of times it doesn't work, and then you're stuck with an animal that gives you other problems. I, I'd be aware of it. I mean, as a as a synopsis, like you know, try to try to swish them off in the very beginning to try to avoid that scenario. Um, again, don't don't crash your tank to try to get rid of them. That's not worth it. However, ignored, they can just. I've seen it many, many times. They can just cover your reef and freak you out. Um, I guess there could be something to say if they if they were allowed to go to too high of proportions and for whatever reason they crashed on their own, that could pose a problem. Sure. My synopsis is uh, the same as hair algae. If you can, nuke it from space. And by that, I mean pull the rocks out and dip them in fresh water and get rid of them. If you have a smaller tank, and you want to get rid of flatworms, man, I think it's way easier to pull the rocks out and then rescape again. Um, so nuke them from space if you can, siphon them out if you can. Flatworm exit works, but it's got its dangers, so be aware of those. And uh, um, you may have to dose several times and biological controls, meh. So yeah, I think that- Yeah, that's, that's the thing with the flatworm exit. Even, even if I was just a hobbyist and I dosed my tank, and the same thing with you saying like flush in the rock, man, you miss two of them and They're you'll back. be right back at square one. So, so I don't like dose it once and I'll, and then I'll like, cool, I got rid of that for the client. Like I will still go through and dose until, you know. Yeah. My protocol was to do it at least three times once a week. Yeah. Uh, and you, you know, if you do it once and then wait three months, you're, you're starting again. So yeah. Thank you everyone for watching. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for, for gently caressing the like button. And uh, thanks to our sponsors, uh, saltwateraquarium.com. And uh, we're happy to be powered by Polyp Lab. Ben, I dig you. I think you're awesome. All right, <laughs> peace. Hey brother. Hey, last time I checked, no one is perfect. So I'm I'm actually pretty perfect. I love you, Ben. I love you too, Richard. If we could have children, I would have. Oh, I guess we can. We need, um, we should we should get a, a donor egg. I hope it's a raccoon. I guess we should clone ourselves and mix the genes together, and it would totally be a raccoon. God, I know people that would want to kill that raccoon. Oh, yeah, lots of people would want to kill that raccoon. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, Fuck. Yeah. Fuck. <clears throat> Fuck. Fuck. Guy. Fuck. 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 I'm fun at parties. <laughs> uh, all right, should we do stuff? All right, should we do stuff? Do stuff? Do stuff? Beef? Beef? How? Er, duh. Bye, Paul. Le -le -la -ba. <laughs> no one's gonna know what the. Yeah. Let's do the yeah. powered by Polyp Lab. 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 Oh, if you say it real fast, real fast, it's like that blah blah blahs log. Powered by Polyp Lab. Powered by Polyp Lab. Powered by Polyp Lab. Powered by Polyp Lab. Follow the yellow brick road. Powered by Polyp Lab. Powered by Polyp Lab. Powered by Polyp Lab. Powered by Polyp Lab. Retory. I didn't know if you know this, but lab is short for laboratory. That doesn't make any sense to me. It's not supposed to. <laughs> I'm getting ready. You know, I opened for Weird Al twice. Are you fucking serious? Yeah. It was great. Man, when I was a kid, he had that TV special. Oh, I can't remember what it was called. But UHF? We, we, his movie? No, even before that. It was just, a, it was on HBO. They had like, Dare to be Stupid as Devo and yeah, yeah. on and on and on. 
that I, we had it on VCR and I used to watch that so much. What's a VCR, old man? Oh man, don't get me started. Uh, 